I'm John Quinones, and that's our program for tonight. But remember to watch next Friday night at this. Yeah, I want to warn them in emergency. There's a house on fire. If you survive a fatal fire, you've got a very good chance of being charged with setting it. Three dead children. An expert saying it's awesome. She was indicted for three counts of first degree murder. My children were my life. I would have never done anything to hurt them, never. There is no credible evidence that she set the fire. None. They had found some patterns on the floor. A lot of people would look at this pattern and they say, gee, somebody must have poured something on the floor. Sentencing someone to death on the basis of one expert's opinion. Who else do you rely on other than an expert? He's not walking in there to find out the truth. He's walking in there to prove that it's arson. Their theory is impossible. This case is all about new science. A bunch of people wanting to be ratio on CSI, and they were really a Barney Fife. You just better hope that the fire investigator that shows up has been paying attention for the last 20 years. Your opinion was at the center of the case. They wouldn't have a case without your opinion. She would have been executed on bad science. That is possible, yes. I thought, I'm an American. This doesn't happen in America. It could happen to any of us. It could happen to you. And now, Elizabeth Vargas and Chris Cuomo. It can happen to anyone, but especially a mother. If you suffer the unthinkable tragedy of losing your children in a fire, a fire which you escape but they don't, you may well be charged with murder if the wrong fire investigator shows up. And often, even if you can avoid being convicted in court, you'll almost certainly be convicted by neighbors who turn on you in what can seem like a modern-day witch hunt. Where were you? How did you let this happen? You're about to meet some mothers who survived the flames, but would they survive the firestorm that came after? Here's Jay Shadler. This is how nearly every fire story starts. A call from dispatch and a scramble in the firehouse. A half a million times every year, firefighters suit up and roll out. At this point, no one's thinking about how the fire started, only how to stop it. Sometimes they win. Sometimes they lose. Four children were killed in the pre-dawn inferno. And sometimes a single tragedy turns doubly devilish. Nine years is a long time to, to go through a mess, an undeserved mess. Amanda Kelly is heading into an Alexandria, Louisiana courtroom, accompanied by her lawyer and her memories. It was nearly 10 years ago that fire swept through her small home here in a subdivision called Sherwood Forest. The street names are from the legend of Robin Hood, but Amanda's story is more a tale from the Brothers Grimm. So the, the last time you were here, was the day of the fire? It's, I haven't been back since that day. It, it's a happy place in a sense because I have a lot of happy memories here, but it's where, it's where my world fell apart. Amanda had three children, Sadie, age 10, Luke, age 6, and Jessica, age 3. On a winter's day in 2001, she left them briefly to cash checks before the local banks closed. You need to cash those checks? Yes. Why? To get groceries. Had you ever left the kids alone before like that? Briefly. Yeah. Briefly, not for very long. And you figured how long you were going to be gone? 15, 20 minutes. 20 minutes that changed everything. When you drove in, you saw flames immediately. Flames around my bedroom window, yes. I ran into the house. I felt my way down the hall. It was so black. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face and tried to get up the stairs to where they should have been to get dressed. That's where their rooms were. And I, I couldn't make it up the stairs. Neither Amanda nor the firefighters could save the children. What's the last image you have of the kids? The last image was Jessica in her pink pajamas with little flowers walking up the steps. She still keeps the children's blanket. For the first few weeks after... They died. I kept it around my neck, and I just 
just rub it. And then I had someone tell me that that was unhealthy and that I needed to, to take it off. It smells like smoke. But the smoke at the scene hadn't even cleared when Detective Bobby Sandoval of the Rapides Parish Sheriff's Department smelled a crime. Were you suspicious of her right off the bat? I was suspicious of her actions. Within the first day? Within the first five minutes. Sandoval's suspicion was initially based on Amanda's behavior the afternoon of the fire. When I talked to her, I didn't see any emotions as far as crying or anything like that. She didn't have no burns. She didn't have nothing. I mean, she just didn't have any signs of, of any person that she would think that went into a boiling black smoke house like she claimed. But an arson charge requires more than curious behavior. Fire investigators want proof, and they claim to have found it. The charred cement slab on which Amanda's house was built showed signs of pockmarks and divots like these. It's called spalling, and the investigators said that only happens in a fire when an accelerant like gasoline has been used. Not only that, but... They tested the soil, it tested positive for gasoline, and there was no reason for that gasoline to be there. Now we have a crime. And the crime, arson murder, is punishable by death. You're accusing this woman of actually burning her children alive. That's your accusation. Yes, and there's nothing more horrific than that. This is about as monstrous uh, an accusation as you could possibly make. Prosecutor Mike Shannon. You're right. What's, what's I mean, losing your children is the worst thing that would happen to happen to a person. The only thing that could be worse, worse or added, added, charge added, added on. Charge was killed. Exactly. I agree with that's exactly what happened in his office. Well, it did. Inside this sheriff's office, the case against Amanda Kelly begins. Next front door. Next to the gas trail. There's a few on the outside of the door. And next to the This is called Spalding. It's next to For nine hours, Detective Sandoval presses Amanda for a confession. Her father is sitting next to him. I'm going to go back. Yeah, I'm going to go Shockingly, the interrogation turns even darker when Detective Sandoval accuses Amanda of dousing her children in gasoline. You know, the state fire marshal's office told me that there was gas poured everywhere out there. Did, they, did the state fire marshal tell you that gas was poured on the kids? No. But you said that to her. Well, you know, sometimes you got to do what it takes to get to the truth. But the truth might very well have been destroyed. Because on the very day after the fire, the investigators had the house bulldozed. We were trying to preserve the scene. And, uh, Wait a minute, you were trying to preserve the scene? Yes. Wasn't it pretty much destroyed the next day? Yes. That, that wasn't my doing. I understand uh, now what happened. You know, that, that was a state fire marshal's call, and uh, I know now that, that that wasn't the right way to handle it. Meanwhile, Amanda keeps insisting she's innocent, even begging to take a lie detector test. But officials never give her the test. Instead, starting with that apparent evidence of spalling on the cement floor, she's eventually imprisoned on three counts of first-degree murder. Do you think she should be executed? There's not a doubt in my mind that that woman didn't kill her children. Did you set this fire? No, absolutely not. I've stood by my innocence from day one. I knew that I was in the presence of a, a bunch of people wanting to be Horatio on CSI, and they were really a Barney Fife. But this is no comedy, and in a moment, she's going to find as bad as things are, they can always get a little worse. Meanwhile, in Indiana, another mom has already served 14 years after being convicted of the same crime, setting a fire to kill her child. Why did they think that you would do that? I don't know. Two mothers suffering twice and possibly burned by false clues left in the ashes. 2020 puts their cases to the test with some disturbing results. The presumption is backwards. You're, you're guilty until, pres un until found innocent in this country. We'll be right back.
You know it's dangerous, and you know it's deadly. But here's something you probably don't know. If you survive a fatal fire, you've got a very good chance of being charged with setting it. John Lentini is one of the nation's leading fire experts. According to him, if just 5% of the nation's half million structure fires every year are suspicious, that makes 25,000 chances to mistakenly charge someone with arson. And if they do that with bad evidence, and a jury believes that it's a set fire, many times there's no doubt about who did it. Enter Christine Bunch, convicted by a jury in 1996 of setting a fire to kill her three-year-old son. His charred body was found where he lived with his mother. I mean, that's like the most, one of the most horrific crimes you can imagine, isn't it? Why did they think that? Why did they think that you would do that? I don't know. Christine and her son Tony lived here in this trailer park on the edge of the small Indiana town of Greensburg. Did you like being a mom? I loved being a mom. What'd you like about it? Uh, I mean everything. Each new step, each new, each new experience. And the pride you get from seeing that child that came from you, it's indescribable. This is one of the only pictures left of Tony after the fire. Where was this picture taken? We had went to, I think it was at Kmart, had had a special that you could do portraits. And they, I had just taken him, I think the week before, and got the baseball outfit. <laughs> and How old is he here? He's about a year and a half. Less than two years later, on a hot summer morning, fire blazed through their trailer. Tony died. And in the ashes, Christine found herself an arson suspect. This is a woman who has no prior criminal history, no arrest record, no psychiatric history. There was nothing here. Jane Raley of Northwestern University's Center on Wrongful Convictions is working to get Bunch a new trial. Right. There's no motive. Why would somebody like Christine do this? No motive in a case where a woman is charged with killing her child. Doesn't that seem like it would demand a motive? Wh why? Um, I, um... You're speechless. I'm speechless. I'm speechless. A speechless lawyer. You know something's going on. And John Lentini thinks he knows what it is. I can turn just about any fire into an arson fire if, if that's what I want to do. We brought Lentini here to Eastern Kentucky University's fire science program. In two identical fires. Uh, this bunker has been set up with rooms of ordinary furniture. In a moment, a fire will be set. The living room portion is what we're actually going to burn. Not with gasoline like an arsonist might use, but with just a spark, as if from a burning cigarette. We're just hoping to generate some of the artifacts that people have in the past called evidence of arson. People like John Lentini himself. Twenty years ago, Lentini got a life-changing lesson in arson fire. Back then, he was convinced that this man, Gerald Lewis, had killed most of his family by setting a fire with gasoline. I was scheduled to be deposed the next morning. For the prosecution? For the prosecution. I was going to say that Gerald Lewis had set the fire. I was going to help him send, uh, send Gerald Lewis to Old Sparky. But before he testified, Lentini had a chance to test the man's claim that the fire began by accident when his couch caught on fire. To Lentini's utter surprise, what's now commonly called the Lime Street Fire Test, left behind the exact same signs as if it had started with gasoline, even though none was used. Uh, what was that like for you? That was, it was an awakening. Which is why today, Lentini is driven to bring hard science into what traditionally has been seen as the art of fire investigation. I think uh, when they said art, they, I think what they meant was luck. Back at the Eastern Kentucky University Fire Science Program, with cameras and thermal imaging devices recording every moment, Investigators begin their fire experiments. The tiny couch fire grows steadily. A layer of hot, dense smoke forms on the ceiling. These thermal images show how hot it is. Red indicates a temperature of nearly 1,200 degrees. Soon, the blazing hot gas starts to descend. Suddenly, just a few minutes after touching off the fire, those hot gases ignite and the room explodes. Yeah, everything is 
This is a phenomenon known as flashover. Flashover is a transition point where you go from having a fire in a room to a room on fire. If you were in a room when flashover occurred, what would you see? It would be the last thing you saw. But what you see after a fire has exploded into flashover is even more important to our story. As Mr. Lentini begins showing us through the ruins, keep these two phrases in mind. Burn patterns like the letter V. Yep, and it comes up. Yep. Comes along here. And all the way to the ceiling. Now that's a V pattern. That's a V pattern. And multiple points of origin. You can see that white pattern on the wall. And then look behind you. Both have often been used as slam dunk evidence of arson, but that's not always true. Show me a couple things in this room that would indicate, could indicate to someone arson. Well, if you see a pattern on the couch that looks like it's uh, where it started because yep. of it, there's a V over there, yep. then you see another V over here, you say, well, that could be two points of origin. Two points of origin, multiple points of origin, that's the key, that's where a, the keys a, in the cup in the slam bank. dunk. A slam dunk that helped put Christine Bunch in the slammer. The state is asking the jury to sentence Bunch to life in prison without parole. During her trial, the prosecution used these photos showing burn patterns as evidence of multiple places of origin. The prosecution looks at this and says, look, there must have been multiple places where the fire began. That is 100% inaccurate, 100% wrong, 100% fiction. That's because all those years ago, when Bunch was convicted, Braley says flashover and the science of arson were not well understood. You've already been in here how long? It'll be 14 years, April 1st. 14 years. If this conviction is not overturned, how long will you be in here? I have four years in time cuts, so that gives me another 12 years to do. The prosecutor in the Bunch case declined our request for an on-camera interview, but maintains that the jury made the right decision, that Christine Bunch is in fact guilty, and that sometimes a person's actions speak louder than science. If so, Amanda Kelly is in serious trouble because the knives are out in her hometown. I believe she done it because she didn't go in after the children. And she didn't even try. 2020, we'll be right back. Investigators at the Louisiana State Fire Marshal's Office have obtained significant physical evidence which substantiates that the fire was not accidental in origin. Back in Louisiana, Amanda Kelly's case, a mother suspected of burning her three children to death, has turned into a stampede of unfounded accusations. Almost every day, another newspaper story, another rumor. Amanda never tried to save her children. The kids were found bound and doused with gasoline. And even years after the fire, her neighbors are still smoldering. I believe she done it because she didn't go in after the children. Neighbor Deborah Mundy. If I was a mother, I would be in there after my children. I don't care. They, nobody would have been able to stop me after, to go after my children. And she didn't even try. To me, that's not a mother. There is no credible evidence that she set the fire. None. Mike Small, one of Louisiana's most well-known defense lawyers, has taken on Amanda's case, but says the atmosphere is poisoned. Defending Amanda was almost like defending Satan. He's not exaggerating. Detective Bobby Sandoval is among those convinced Amanda's guilty. I was having all kinds of church members and different people going to her and people calling me and telling me that there possibly may be a cult over there. There was a cult? There was evidence of a cult? I was being told. None of these allegations were ever proven, but arson trials are often staged on an uneven playing field, according to John Lentini. Burning someone to death is, is a monstrous thing to do. And so the state proves that the person is a monster. They prove the defendant is a monster. So by the time that the jury starts to hear any science at all, they already have made up their mind, perhaps, on the character of the... They already hate the guy or the woman. Uh, because they've been character assassinated for the last six days or six weeks. My job is a fact finder. I have to, I have to go out and, and gather all the information and turn it in to the district attorney's office. Including the rumor and in, innuendo and everything. Anything. Still, all the rumors and the gossip would have meant nothing if there had not been some hard evidence that Amanda set the fire. 
That evidence, you might remember, was something called spalling, pitted marks in the foundation floor. Now, in Amanda's case, the fire investigators said that spalling was proof positive that gasoline had been poured there. So we tested that idea here at Combustion Science and Engineering, a laboratory in Columbia, Maryland. It specializes in studying the chemistry and physics of how fire behaves. The old theory was that a gasoline-fed fire would produce rough, pockmarked concrete like this. But watch what actually happens. So one of the things you can see is you can see the liquid boiling. Oh, yeah. Well, the temperature will never get any higher than the boiling point of that liquid underneath it. So the liquid actually acts to protect the concrete. That's right. The gasoline-fed fire leaves the slab charred but completely smooth. But you can clearly see that flammable liquids alone will not produce uh, spalling of concrete. This is probably one of the basic old wives' tales right here, isn't it? It is one of the oldest wives' tales that existed, yes. Why has it survived so long? Uh, ignorance. Why don't more fire investigators know about this stuff? It's not a culture that you learn stuff this way. You learn from your daddy who learned from his daddy. Right. And it's just the belief system of, you know, your mentor is just handed down. And in Amanda's case, those dominoes of outdated beliefs kept falling right into the hands of the prosecutor. How powerful for a prosecutor is a fire investigator's evidence of arson? I'm not an arson expert. I have to rely on somebody. The investigators on the scene, that's, that's, that's pretty strong. Prosecutor Mike Shannon says the investigation into Amanda's fire continued even after a Louisiana district court found that the initial arson charge, including the spalling evidence, had relied on, quote, old wives' tales. Instead, the case against Amanda is now based solely on the opinion of fire expert John DeHaan. The original conclusion was that the fire was deliberately started in at least two, if not three, places. So you were, you were seeing multiple places where the fire started and a rapid fire spread. Yes, and the elements of time, of course, were only established by the interviews or the, or the information from the witness. So in DeHaan's opinion, the rapid spread of the fire signaled that either an accelerant was used or multiple fires had been set. Either way, it's arson. You write, what, this was a result of a deliberate ignition. In, in layman's terms, that means what? That means it was deliberately started, that it was not an accidental fire. That's just wrong. It's, it's the most egregious misstatement of science that I've seen in my 30-some years doing this. John Lentini thinks Dr. DeHaan has read the arson tea leaves all wrong. So you have two nationally recognized fire experts drawing two dramatically different conclusions of what happened at Amanda's house. So there is still a, a very significant element of interpretation that goes on. There's a huge element of interpretation. It's all about interpretation. The jury can't understand what it means. That's why you need an expert. Would you personally ever want to be charged with the death penalty based on the evidence of one expert? Not if I was innocent, I wouldn't. But of course, the question of innocence or guilt is still very much in doubt for Amanda, who's waiting in jail with a possible death sentence hanging over her head. And up in Indiana, where Christine Bunch is seeking a new trial, she's already spent 14 years in prison for being convicted of setting a fire that killed her young son, Tony. Just as in Amanda Kelly's case, Bunch was being tried in the press and in the public long before her day in court. Police don't know the motive for the crime, but offered this. Family members are family members, and uh, sometimes the people we love hurt us the most. I mean, they called you stupid. They called you uh, cold-hearted. Um, tired of being a mother was another quote. I mean, if I wasn't all of those things, how many newspapers would they sell? The presumption is backwards. You're, you're guilty until, pres un until found innocent in this country. That's just the way it is. Uh, anybody that, that still believes that sixth grade civics class, is, they're sadly mistaken. I just hope they never get arrested. The attorneys defending Bunch don't go quite that far, but do insist that the fire at Christine Bunch's trailer was investigated using old science now viewed as bogus. This case is all about new science. It's about the jury not having complete information at the time they render their guilty verdict. But if old myths about arson are responsible for putting innocent people behind bars, can new investigative tests set them free? 
a startling turn of events in the bunch case. What you're arguing is that he was dead long before the flames ever got to him. Stay with us. 2020 will be right back. There wasn't much left of Christine Bunch's trail after fire swept through it, killing her young son, Tony. But what was left, according to fire investigators at the time, was unmistakable evidence of arson. The arson conclusion was made within two hours of the investigators uh, arriving at the, at, the, at the trailer. Wait a minute, within two hours? Within two hours. That conclusion was that Bunch had poured an accelerant in her son's bedroom, touched off the fire, and let him die. I'm never going to stop fighting, never going to stop trying to prove that I didn't do this. And a key to getting Bunch a new trial may be this woman, whose opinion about the prosecution's original arson case can be summed up in four words. Their theory is impossible. Jamie McAllister of Combustion Science and Engineering specializes in an emerging field of science, mixing biology and toxicology with fire behavior. This is the autopsy report on Tony Bunch. It shows he died with 80% carbon monoxide in his blood, an impossibly high number, says McAllister, if the fire had been set in his room. You couldn't breathe in that amount of, of carbon monoxide and get to that 80% level before you would die from the heat. That means the fire wasn't touched off in his bedroom, but took a long time to build. What you're arguing is that he was dead long before the flames ever got to him. Yes. According to McAllister, basic biology suggests the fire had to have started in a place unventilated, where it could smolder and smoke before igniting into flames. Where could that be? McAllister theorizes it started up above, in the space between the ceiling and the roof, where there were electrical wires and a malfunctioning light. A short in the wires could have, in turn, overheated the ceiling tiles. And as that smoldering occurs, it produces a lot of products like soot and carbon monoxide, and they would leak out into the room. In her theory, thin smoke full of carbon monoxide seeps below where Tony is sleeping. Why isn't Tony waking up? He's probably incapacitated. He's essentially passed out, so he can't react to the situation. Meantime, in the space above, the fire builds. The ceiling tiles eventually break down and fall out. Now fed by more oxygen, much thicker, hotter smoke billows into the room. Very quickly, he's going to inhale those products, and he's going to die very quickly from those products. Soon, the burning ceiling tiles ignite other fires in the room, and it takes very little time for the whole trailer to go up. For Bunch's lawyer, the new toxicology evidence leads to only one conclusion. The fire could not have started in the living room. It could not have started in the bedroom. So we know that the fire could not have happened the way the state claims. But if this fire did not happen uh, as the prosecution claimed it happened, why wouldn't a new trial be a guarantee? Well, it's, it, it's always difficult to unravel a wrongful conviction. And that's especially true in arson cases. We've already seen how hard it is to fight an arson charge when it's first leveled. But getting the conviction overturned is nearly impossible, even when the stakes are a matter of life and death. Todd Willingham is a perfect example. In 1992, he was convicted and sentenced to death for killing his three children in an arson fire in Corsicana, Texas. This is the bed where the two-year-old was found in the middle of the bed. While waiting for his execution, virtually every piece of physical evidence against him was reviewed and discredited by independent fire expert Gerald Hurst, who's been in the vanguard of bringing hard science into fire investigations. The William case is like a hundred other cases I've seen, except that they executed him. And the others are whiling away in prison. Last year, a scathing report to the Texas Forensic Science Commission concluded that the Willingham arson investigation was, quote, nothing more than a collection of personal beliefs that have nothing to do with science-based fire investigations. Nevertheless, one of those original fire investigators, Doug Fogg, remained adamant when he was interviewed last year. I had no doubt that the fire was deliberately set. Among the evidence he uses to support that opinion is something called crazed glass, tiny cracks that sometimes show up in the aftermath of a fire. We found them during our fire test with John Lentini. This used to be evidence of arson. 
it was a myth that people used it. They used it on Todd Willingham. They said, we know that this fire was a very rapid fire because we got this crazed glass. Turns out, crazed glass is not the work of an arsonist, but it's likely been caused by a fireman. When the cold spray from his hose hits a window, Doug Fogg is still not convinced. They're going to take it to these labs and they're going to blah, 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 and try to disapprove it. Well, I'll take it lab and disapprove it. But uh, come to the real world sometime. Go out and let the beast get a hold of it. On February 17, 2004, Texas Governor Rick Perry refused to stop the execution of Todd Willingham. He died by lethal injection. Was an innocent man executed in Texas? Yes. No question about no it. Right. And now, Lentini believes another innocent man is sitting in a Texas prison, serving a 17-year sentence for an arson conviction. I love you, sweetie. I love you, too. Sue Severns only occasionally gets to speak to her husband, Curtis, by phone these days. I'll call you a little bit later. All right, thank you. Right. Uh-huh, bye-bye. He was convicted of setting fire to his gun shop in Plano, Texas. No one died. As first reported in the Texas Observer, the prosecution's key arson evidence was a burn pattern they argued indicated three separate fires and arson. How do you think that fire started? I think there was an electrical fire. Lentini was part of Curtis's defense team. He says in the gun shop's cluttered workshop, a frayed cord on a fan probably ignited the fire. Nearby aerosol cans could have exploded, setting off multiple fires. Prosecution experts said that was impossible. The jury convicted him. I walked into the trial maybe even cocky, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I thought this is this is nuts. This is, you know, yep. we'll, we'll be able to tell our story. It's no big deal. It, it just doesn't turn out that way. That's just not the way it works. Instead, Severns heads to federal prison, even as John Lentini discovers a surprising videotape, one he claims the prosecution should have known about. It shows a test of exactly what can happen when aerosol cans are overheated. As the temperature rises, the cans burst and fly around the room. Slowing the tape shows clearly the flaming cans touching off new fires. So the video shows that that, that, that could very well have been the multiple point points. The fact is they misrepresented the science during his trial, and they ridiculed me for trying to bring that up. Armed with the tape, Curtis's lawyer appealed. But the judge said it would make no difference to the jury and denied the appeal. Ironically, the federal prosecutor in the case, who declined our request for an interview, had offered Severns a plea deal prior to his conviction. Why didn't you take the plea deal, Curtis? Yeah, because I didn't do it. That's exactly what Amanda Kelly keeps saying back in Louisiana. I was a law-abiding citizen. I would feel guilty if I went over the speed limit and got a speeding ticket, and I'm in jail for four years with... The, the death penalty hanging over my head. But hold on. The fire expert who put Amanda on that road to death row is about to deliver quite a revelation to the prosecutor. And he said, well, you know, I've done other tests, and I can't really go with my original conclusion. I said, what? 2020, we'll be right back. Amanda Kelly and her attorney have walked through some dark days together, beginning with those arson charges that should set the fire that killed her three young children. Many death penalty cases, indeed in most death penalty cases, the evidence of guilt is overwhelming. Amanda turns that model on its head. For four years, Amanda remained imprisoned up there on the fifth floor of the Alexandria, Louisiana jail. While stories that she'd douse the kids in gasoline before setting them on fire swirled through town. The talk and the rumors, did that ever amount to any solid evidence at all? No. Never did? No. This office was going to seek the death penalty, have her executed, on the basis of rumor and innuendo, no, innuendo no, 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 and no, bad no. science. No, no. Based upon an expert's report that we had no reason at the time to believe was bad science. You remember the original evidence of arson, something called spalling on the concrete floor of Amanda's house, was determined to be nothing more than an old wives' tale by an appellate court. Next came fire expert John DeHaan, 
claiming rapid spread and multiple fires indicated it was deliberately started, that it was not an accidental fire. On the basis of DeHaan's opinion, Amanda was charged with arson and murder, punishable by execution. But in 2008, Prosecutor Shannon, who has now taken over the case, decides to review all the evidence, including John DeHaan's arson conclusion. So Shannon calls him up. He said, well, you know, I've done other tests, and I can't really go with my original conclusion. I said, what? Had Prosecutor Shannon not called you, when would you have told everyone that your opinion had changed? I, I don't invent reasons to go back and re-examine cases. This case had been under judicial review for several years. DeHaan now says, based on new science and a review of the testimony, his original conclusion cannot be defended to a suitable degree of scientific certainty. He, in effect, says, everything I said earlier about this fire having been intentionally set, disregard, because it cannot be scientifically supported. He's saying, essentially, in his report, what our experts had been saying from day one. When you came to the decision that your original conclusion about a deliberately set fire might be wrong, at that point, why didn't you call the prosecutor? Well, because I was unaware of what was going on. But your, your opinion was at the center of the case. They wouldn't have a case without your opinion. I respond to the requests of my clients. I don't just invent reasons to go off and create new materials. Had this gone to trial in 2004, she would have been executed on bad science. That is possible, yes. This case could have gone to trial, right? Yes, sir. This case could have been concluded with finding her guilty of first-degree murder. Certainly a possibility. She could have been sentenced to death. Yes. All true. Yes. Yes. And would you? And do you want me to say at this point that had that happened based on what I know right now, would have been a miscarriage of justice? Yes. I would think. I would. I believe it would have been. Thank God we didn't get to that point. Of course, the point Amanda did get to was tragically bleak. Four years in jail, eight years under a shadow. Have you ever called Amanda and asked her or told her? why you changed it or apologized in any way? No. I mean, I'm just asking as a man, do you ever, do you ever stop and think, boy, she must have gone through hell? I've been dealing with uh, clients of, of all kinds for 40 years, and uh, I'm sure the experiences they have are unpleasant. Do you have any message for Amanda? No, I do not. Though the experts and the lawyers now agree there's no proof of arson, Detective Sandoval, who pressed so hard for Amanda's confession eight years ago. Hasn't moved an inch. How did you feel when you realized that she was not going to be uh, charged with capital punishment? I had, uh, charged with arson? I had a nauseating feeling. Because there's not a doubt in my mind that this lady didn't kill her children. I wouldn't say anything to him. I pray for him. I, he's, he's pitiful. I don't know how he sleeps at night. Do you feel justice has been done here? No. With all the lies and the rumors and the false accusations, no. It will be one day, though. I believe that. I believe we all answer for what we've done when we stand before God. And Sandoval will. He'll have to answer. I'm hoping today will be the last day. In the end, with the arson charges dropped, Amanda and her lawyer agreed to accept a much lesser charge of negligent homicide for having left the children alone. It was a plea deal she found despicable but necessary to avoid another day in court or jail. And it was heartbreaking. I had to turn to the side before I said guilty because my children were my life. I deal with the guilt every day. If I would have stayed home, if I would have done this, if I would have done that. But I can't go back in time. But I do know that as a mother, I would have never done anything intentionally to hurt them. Never. Amanda no longer lives in Alexandria. She's returned to the back roads and mountains of West Virginia, her family's ancestral home. And where, just around the bend, lies the burial ground of her children.
Lucky loved giraffes, and Jessica loved elephants, epiphants, she'd call them. And Sadie's dad called her pumpkin. Like iron from a forge, Amanda has been reshaped. Walking out of the jail with no handcuffs on or shackles on my feet. No what this fire didn't destroy, it strengthened. She's writing a book. It's to tell the truth about what happened and to encourage people that no matter what they're going through, there's hope. Do you ever go to bed at night thinking, what if, on this case? Probably have. What do you think of arson investigations? I think they are. I think you got to be very careful. Very careful. Pretty easy to jump to conclusions. Oh yes, indeed. Sure, sure it is. And it's it's not an exact science. Far from it. That is our program for tonight. But remember to tune in again next Friday for What Would You Do? Starting at 9 Eastern, followed, of course, by 2020. I'm Chris Bloom. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas. For all of us at 2020 and ABC News, we're in touch, so you be in touch all the time online at abcnews.com. Have a great weekend and happy Mother's Day.